Next, on the OHIO podcast, legacy recruit Will Smith Jr. commits to the Buckeyes. Jim Trestle strikes back, and we give our top five Buckeye encounters. And that all starts right now. It's so easy to be average. You know it as well as I know it. It takes a little something to be special, Don. It takes a little something special to be a great player. We don't have enough great players. To hell with that! We don't want to coach average. I don't want to be around you. Why be around average? Be proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the football field. Three things. Number one, the team that hits the hardest and the longest, the team that starts the fastest, and the team is too damn smart to make mistakes. If you take it to them, if you don't make mistakes, and you keep taking it to them, hell, there's no question who wins. Buckeye Podcast, by fans, for the fans, where they hate that team up north as much as you do. It's time for the OHIO Podcast. OHIO! Welcome back to the OHIO Podcast, everybody. I'm your host, Buckeye Boggs, recording live from another snowy Sunday evening in North Central Ohio, and I am joined by my partner in crime, just a few more miles north of me, Chris Wilds, who... Uh, was heading back from Northeast Ohio today. How was that trip home, my man? Well, I'll tell you, nothing is better than 35 miles an hour for, uh, you know, 120 miles there on 71. No, nothing better than that. <laughs> nothing better than sliding around 71. I got gotcha. you. Down in Texas, he's the Sergeant MVP here to tell us how awesome the weather is down there. Aaron Brown. 64. Not as sunny, though, but I'll take it. I got some lights installed on my motorcycle. So I'm happy. <laughs> are you? Are you? Wait a minute. You have a motorcycle? Yeah. Are you like uh, like uh, Tom Cruise and Top Gun here? No, my bike's cooler. <laughs> I can just see you driving around the army base with this thing, man. With oh, your hey. with your with your sunglasses on. Yeah, I, I see of, you. Dude, a lot of people do it because it saves gas. Because we got to move a lot, so it saves a lot of gas. Oh, well. And I, I look cool. <laughs> oh, there it is. All right. <laughs> I figure it was coming in. All right, guys. If you're not satisfied with pickup games and unranked matches, chances are you're aiming higher than most. <laughs> Aspire. You'll train to be the best, whether you're drawn to the pool, track, mat, basketball court, or gaming controller. We provide the training you need to achieve your dream, make our facilities your home, or take advantage of free transportation services. Are you ready to unlock your potential? Visit SpireCleveland.com today. We've got a commitment this uh, weekend, a couple hours ago. He's a legend, uh, the son of a legend, I should say. Will Smith Jr., class of 2023, defensive end from Dublin, Ohio, just south of me here in Delaware. 6'3", 260 pounds, a three-star, ranked 540th nationally. 71st at his position, 14th in the state of Ohio. He was offered, I believe it was a week or so ago. Didn't take long to make that decision. Wants to go to school where daddy went to school, made a name for himself. Will Smith Jr. is a Buckeye. I'll start with you first, Aaron. Your thoughts on this young man? I really like this, not just because of who his dad was either. Like I, I'm sure you guys saw the film too. But the fact he's homegrown right there at uh, Dublin Kaufman, uh, it, as I said, the, you know, the son of Will Smith, you know, rest in peace. That was a very unfortunate circumstance. I wish he was here to, to see his boy play and, and do all this. That would really be, you know, the icing on the cake. But as far as his film goes, <clears throat> I like that he plays at a good level. I felt like he really fired off the ball uh, at a good level. He's getting into the backfield, which means he's got a solid push off the line. Uh, really good at working his way down the line on run plays. So if you've ever noticed, like on on defensive ends or even tackles, 
they'll get into the backfield and kind of slide their way down and they're not they're like kind of sidestepping it, it's kind of weird you just make sure you guys watch it next time just pull up anything on on youtube and look at how the defensive line plays when they get to or get behind the offensive line. Watch what they do. He does this really well, and he can chase the play down. He's got a great motor, and he's actually like deceptively fast. Like I was, I was very, very pleased with the film. He's a good tackler. He's very physical. I like this. I, I don't know that he sh- he should probably be a four star, but hey, if they give him three, then so be it. Okay, I have a little bit of a different take than you, Aaron. Now, obviously, you know the techniques and things from a coaching standpoint better than me, but let me share with you what my eyes saw, and then you can tell me, Aaron, where I'm wrong or, or maybe where I'm right and, and maybe maybe being a little overcritical here. First off, not on film, but just in reality, living in the shadow of a famous father cannot be easy. Can't be easy. But I will say I can tell that this kid wants to make his own way just by watching the film. He's got a motor, and I like his motor. I think he's a smart player who understands angles and gap integrity. Not really sure what that means, but I wrote it down, Aaron. (laughs) I (laughs) I guess what I'm saying is, and you kind of described it better than what I did there, it seems like he's in the backfield a lot, and it, it, he's and he gets there by not necessarily just bull rushing. Um, I didn't see a ton of like hand fighting technique that a lot of like four and five star high level defensive ends know how to do: swim moves, spin moves, you know, um, getting off the ball really quick on the outside and getting pressure on the quarterback. I see just a lot of just a lot of grit and guts in his film. Um, he needs to hit the weight room, I think, a little bit, Aaron. I think he needs to work on his technique, but obviously that'll come through uh, better coaching at the next level. Um, I also thought his tackling was subpar. He gets his hands on a lot of running backs, doesn't really bring a ton of them down. There's a lot of his highlight film where he's in the backfield and he's got his hands on the guys, but they slip away from him. But I'll give him this. He don't stop on a play, and he got, he comes from behind, and if you don't hear him coming, he'll crush you. So – that's kind of my takeaways. I think he's a solid three star, but maybe you can better explain what I saw there. Well, as far as like swim moves and hand fighting, I saw some of that. It, it just wasn't as exaggerated because he plays with his hands inside so well. OK, so, I mean, we can go you can go back and, and check that out. And is it, is it every play? No, it does need to get better. I, I agree with that part. And that's probably what's keeping him from being a four star, to be honest. Uh, as far as like, um, what'd you say? Gap integrity and, yeah. and, uh, angles. Yeah. That's pretty much what I was explaining, like getting behind the offensive line and playing down the line. Uh, he's, he's able to get to those spots very quickly. He gets in there. I mean, it's cause it's, he's, it's hard to explain cause he's not the biggest guy. You know what I mean? He could use some weight room. But he does find a way to get back there, and it's not bull rushing. So what does that tell you? It, I mean, he's not just getting lucky. He's he's certainly not Barry Sanders getting through there. So that tells me he's got some good hand fighting. And watching him, his hands are inside a lot. He doesn't have exaggerated moves like what we would expect to see, perhaps. But again, these are things that could be improved. Uh, he's going to learn more techniques, and they're going to get better. Because um, you're right. I, I saw what you're saying. Uh, as far as like living in his his dad's shadow, that's not easy. He's he, he's gonna learn, and he's gonna he looks like he wants to learn. He wants to be at Ohio State. He said it felt like home as soon as he took his visit. Because I mean, what he visited uh, Saturday and then announced it Sunday evening. So I like the get that. That's just how I feel about it. But as far as what you're saying, Eric, that's it. it all makes sense. Chris, your two cents, man. Yeah, I like it. Uh... I'm with Aaron. I thought the hands were could, could use a little work, but I, I thought that he had fairly active hands, uh, you know, but I think his game, I think he's going to be definitely on the interior of that defensive line. I think he's going to have more of a speed and finesse game once he refines that technique. Um, but, you know, if you watch the footage, it seemed like in his sophomore year, he played a lot more at the end. Uh, but he gained, what, 20 pounds, I think, between the sophomore and junior years. And they moved him more to the inside during that junior year. You know, if he can gain another 20 pounds during this season, uh, you know, I think he's going to be okay 
as he enters uh, Ohio State in 2023. Uh, real quick question. I'll start with you first, Chris. <clears throat> Do you think Ryan Day at any point feels like he should – go ahead and take a kid like this just because of his bloodlines. Do you think there's maybe a little bit of favoritism here or do you think Ryan day don't care about any of that? You know, I could see the appeal of it, but honestly, I think Ryan day just wants to win. I think that they see something in this kid. I see something in this kid. I think that before this season ends, I think this coming season ends, I think he's a four star uh, going into it. Uh, Go, uh, wrapping up his uh, senior year. Okay. Aaron, do you have any thoughts on that question? I mean, I think that it, it, it certainly helps like getting your foot in the door. You know what I mean? Like getting eyes on you. But I, I don't think that if he didn't at least have the potential to get on the field, I don't think Ryan day would have extended the offer. So I, okay. I think there is something there, but it certainly helps to have your dad be Will Smith. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And we're not talking about the actor either. And you're right, Aaron. I, um, I I wish I wish Will could be around to see his son play. That would be a lot of fun. It's always great to see former Buckeyes at the shoe who are there supporting their kids. Uh, in the past year, you had Orlando Pace doing that. Uh, his son was is in the linebacker room as a as a walk on. Uh, let's see if I can remember some more here. Um, we had uh, well Kirk Herbstreet's son was a tight end as a as a, a walk on. Of course, Kevin Wilson, the coach, his son was a walk-on as a center who actually ended up playing quite a bit at the beginning of the year. Um, who am I missing, guys? Uh, oh, D- D- Marvin Harrison. Yeah, Marvin Harrison Jr. who had to bust, bust, you know, the bust down. Of course, he wasn't a buck guy. I think he played at Syracuse, if I'm not mistaken. I think, yeah, I think that's right. But, uh, you know, that's always great to have that guy hanging around, things like that. Um, but it's always awesome to see former players and their sons getting chances to – to make the team and, 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 and play. So I think that's, that's a awesome for the, for the Smith family and uh, congratulations to Will Smith jr. So um, from a three star to a one star guys, um, I don't know if you got to see this this week or not, but the sweater vest made a return to striking Michigan fans where it hurts the most. <laughs> I Love Jim Tressel. I I know you two know how much I love Jim Tressel. He is my favorite coach in my lifetime at Ohio State. And on a podcast this week, he was asked about Jim Harbaugh, and he was asked to give a star rating to Jim Harbaugh, one through five stars. And Jim Tressel, who's always politically correct and who always takes the higher road, said, you know, it's unfair for me to give him a true star rating because I don't know – the type of relationships he has with him and with himself and the players. And, and when it comes to academics, things outside of the football program in real life, things of that nature. And they were going to, they were almost going to let him walk away without doing a real star rating. But then Jim couldn't help himself because he's a Buckeye at heart. And he said, as far as the rivalry is concerned, I would give Jim Harbaugh a one star rating in the rivalry. <laughs> And I loved it. I don't know if you guys saw that. Did you guys have any reaction to that at all, Chris, Aaron, either one of you? I didn't get to read it. Okay, Chris, did you I didn't get that? to read the full article, but let me tell you, I love it. Yeah. I absolutely love it because you know what? These guys are running around here like they are God's gift to football after one win in the last decade. And I think the trust just needed to to throw that out there to, you know, maybe humble these guys back down a little bit. Yeah, yeah. The sweat, the sweater strikes back. That's kind of the sweater vest strikes back. That's kind of what I saw him doing right there. I loved it. Um, I, you could see the smirk on Jim Tressel's face, like he knew. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you where it hurts, boys. <laughs> like I love it. Um, anyways, that got me thinking, guys. What are some one star things? And and I we've got some football, we have some non football. I'll start first here, Aaron. I think you're gonna like this. One star things. How about the one star refs from the SEC from 2019? How about that one? I think Amen a, to that. I think that's a <laughs> one star rating, right? I don't even know that I could give them half a star for that crap, man. That was awful. 
I think you practically get one star just for showing up, I think. Yeah, just for existing. Yeah, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go along with that. All right, Aaron, how about you give me one, man? <clears throat> okay, so anybody in Ohio knows what I'm talking about, and if you've ever been to this restaurant, you'll appreciate it. But the White Castle Aftermath, one star. <laughs> Have you ever seen the meme where the bathroom blew up? And yeah. Is that a White Castle? <laughs> yeah. But but on the on the flip side, if you're married, it's definitely a five star experience because you get them. Oh gosh. You guys oh, feel me? I feel you. Yeah. Oh wow. On so many levels, I feel you. Um, <laughs> Chris, go ahead and follow that one. Well, I'll tell you, Eric. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna bust out a Buckeye one star here. How about the one-star performance of Bryson Shaw at safety this season? Ooh, ouch. Come on. The stat line wasn't awful. 59 tackles, an interception, a fumble recovery, a couple passes defense. But let's face it, he spent more time out of position, taking bad angles and missing tackles than anything else this season. Tell me I'm wrong. Uh, I can't. I can't. can't. That's 100% right. Uh, how about one star also from Ohio, you guys? One star for the months of January and February when it comes to the weather here in our great state of Ohio. I hate these two months. And the last two weekends has proven why I absolutely hate January and February in Ohio. Ohio, Mother Nature, you get one star in January and February here. Aaron, you got another one, man? Yes. Taco Bell, period. <laughs> Just one that. star all around, huh? One star all around. The food is terrible, and the aftermath is worse. Another food-related for me, it just happened this evening. One star for the Domino's delivery app. My wife and I ordered our dinner at 4.45. The delivery app said that our food will be arriving at about 5.30. Our food arrived after two phone calls at 6.55. Domino's delivery app. One star, Chris. Mm. Eric, I found this one out there just for you, buddy. One star to the Bengals offensive line. <laughs> Come on. In spite it of this went. line, in spite of this line, the Bengals continue to move on in the playoffs. But the question has to remain, Eric, how long before Burrow ends up going down again? Oh, I mean, I'm not a Bengal geez. fan. I despise the Bengals. But man, I want to see Burrow succeed. You got to love the kid. You got to love his story. But I worry about his career behind that line. They're going to get him killed. My phone call after the game, after the field, the, the, the <clears throat> field goal went through the uprights, I dialed my dad up and I said, Dad, have you ever seen a team so good with an offensive line that is so bad? And he goes, no. Imagine where they would be if they had some actual all pros in the offensive line. So if they had a real offensive line, I would say they're a Super Bowl favorite. I really would. I I, I agree. But that, that offensive line, oh, yeah, good call there. Uh, how about we go with this one right now? This is not, not to get too political, but I will here. One star on the empty grocery store shelves, people. <laughs> not good, man. <laughs> no, no, very bad. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just saying right now, grocery shelves, one star. <laughs> Hey, what you got, Aaron Brown? Okay, so for my veteran buddies, you know how this is in the winter. I don't care if you are in Texas because it's still cold. It's the low 20s in the mornings. PT time. One star. Absolutely one star. The worst right now. Terrible. But then it gets up to 60, so you don't know how to dress yourself. Terrible experience. It's called layers, right? You just go you in can't. layers. That's, well, that's why I said the veteran people would appreciate it because the Army doesn't care if you're cold. Uh. <laughs> there aren't layers. You can't just dress how you want. Like They will put out a uniform, and you have to wear that. You can't supplement it with anything else. Yikes. I didn't know that. That's, that sounds bad. Chris, Star, you, my got, friend. <laughs> you got another one, buddy? Yeah, Eric, we're going back to the grocery store, man. Okay. The self-checkout line. <laughs> Seriously, come on, man. Half the time, these damn things don't work anyhow. You end up needing somebody to come over, an associate to come over and help you, type in their code. You know, you got 10 employees up at the service desk doing their Jim Harbaugh impersonations, picking their nose, 
doing nothing. You got two registers open in the middle of the store, lines back into the clothing department. Man, I was at Walmart recently. I experienced this. It, it was a mess. And nobody uses these self-checkouts. Nobody wants them. You know, why do I want to put somebody out of work, you know, so that they can have me check out my own groceries, bag my own groceries? How I did that when I was 16 years old working at Kroger's. I don't want to do it anymore. Get rid of them. No more self-checkouts. I think if you use a self-checkout line, you should automatically get an employee discount. Absolutely. Because you're working that. Them. Yeah, yeah, I think it's absolutely. I think that's auto. If that was the case, it would raise up to at least a two or three star at that point. But I agree with you, Chris. One star in the sub checkout. How about this? Ohio Stadium. Anybody who's ever been to the horseshoe, do not get suckered into buying tickets in B deck. One star on the back rows in B deck. Yes, C deck overhangs over you so you don't get hit with blasted by the rain or snow or sun at times, but you can't see anything in the TVs they have that they have connected to the poles that are blocking half of the field are literally from 1994 back rows of B deck at Ohio stadium. One star Aaron. Oh, that one's that one was legit. Cause I've sat in B deck and that's not a, not a good time. Just so, stay home. Just stay home. Pretty, you might as well. But I didn't know any better at the time, so I took right. you know what I mean. They, they were free, and I was yeah. like, oh, I'll you go check it into out. Them, man. You literally yeah, get I, suckered into B deck tickets. I think it was the year we played Hawaii. I think. Okay. You remember that? I don't yeah. know what. I can't remember if it was 2015 or 16. I can't remember, but uh, I, it was 20. It was it was 2015. It was the year after the national championship because it was like, why aren't we crushing these guys? Yeah. Card, Cardell Jones started, and he did terrible. And I was actually at that game too. I was in the north end zone. I would have traded in a heartbeat. I wouldn't have traded with you at all. <laughs> oh, <that's... laughs> anyway, concessions one star. We'll go with that one because those prices are absolutely stupid. But my my real one star on this traditional must have Mark May one star as a human being. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well done. Well done. Yeah, one star. Like oh, just anything, anything. Mark May one star. Chris, what you got? You got any more? Eric, I, I, I'm going to foreshadow a little bit here to our sister podcast. How about one star on sports movie sequels? <laughs> <laughs> I had the misfortune of watching Caddyshack 2 again the other day. Oh, did you now? By far the worst movie I think I have ever seen. Have you watched Slapshot 2 yet? I have not watched that one yet. Hey, hey, pleasantly surprised. Decent movie. Yeah. Yeah, I kid okay. you not. Well, I'll tell you what. Caddyshack 2 and Sandlot 2 lower the bar for all the rest. Oh, yeah. Sandlot 2 is, is – I can't, I can't even – I can't even talk about the movie. I'll refuse to talk about it. Uh, Aaron, you got any more before I give my last one? Nope. Mark May was my exclamation point. All right. Chris, you got any more? Because I think I got the topper here. I, I do I do have one more. Okay. Let's, let's talk about the scheduling gods for football. Come on. I, I was looking again. We talked about it a little bit last week. But that Michigan schedule for this upcoming season, they have their opponents have a total record of 70 and 80. And do you realize that over 30 of those wins came against three teams or came in three teams, Ohio State, Iowa and Michigan State. They don't have a game on their schedule outside of Ohio State or at Ohio State and at Iowa that should not be an easy win. They have a four. They have a four game schedule, two at home, two on the road. They've got Penn State at home. They've got um, who else is the other one at home? Oh, Michigan State at home, and then they've got Iowa and Ohio State on the road. Those are the only four games that are worth watching on their twelve-game schedule. Period. And I don't even know if those home games are going to be that competitive. I still don't know what we're going to see out of Michigan State again this year. Was True. last year a fluke? True. They don't have Kenneth Walker. I mean. My early inclination, guys, is that Maryland is going to take that that, that uh, mantle as being that 
that surprise team in the in the East that's kind of like they're good. They could get you if you're not ready. Man, you've been hanging on to his little brother for the last two years, man. Hey, well, I, watch that bowl game, dude. And then have you seen that they just got two more five stars transfer? Yes. In? Yeah, that's Maryland what I'm saying. is legit, man. I'm telling you, they are. If they stay healthy, they are very dangerous. They will be dangerous. Yes. Uh, all right, my last one star, guys. And I can't help it. I had to go here. One star quarterback. Anybody have an idea? Anybody got a one star quarterback hanging around? Um, Tate Martell. I was just about to say that. Does his rhyme his <laughs> name rhyme with fate? Yeah. Yeah. Tater tot. One star he, quarterback. He man. retired, man. You can't dog him. He retired. One star I, quarterback. I asked you before, Eric. Didn't you have to actually play in order to retire? Uh, he did. You know, I, I go back to the, was it Tulane or Tulsa? He got in in the fourth quarter and just like was 11 for 11 or something like that. And his first 11 passes. I don't know. He holds an Ohio state record that I don't even know of. That's how unimportant I feel like it is. <laughs> it's that one. Yeah. I think it's the first, his first 11 passes in college were, were completed. Something like that. And he only completed 13 for his career. So. Pretty you know, solid numbers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyways, good old Tater Tot retired to work on his business. You guys want to take a take a gander at what his business is going to be? I think it's going to be a Tater Tot business. Hair care so, products. Hair care products. Oh, he's going to be a model like his sister. Is he going to like jump on her uh, coattails? Well, well, let's let's be honest. He's not a bad looking dude. I can say that. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> but I, I can't think of anything else that he would do with his All life. Did, and hair care wait products. Minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did Aaron just say Tate Martell is not a bad looking dude? I didn't say he was better he looking did. than me. I said he's not a bad looking dude, but he's not better looking than me. Period. <laughs> like, I, you know, I've got it, Eric. OK, I know the business. All right. This dude's traveled around so much. Travel agent. There you go. Yeah, I've. Uh, he's like that song, I've been everywhere, man. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he could literally start a transfer portal business. That he knows. He's probably going to use his parents' money to fund this startup. Let's be real. Either that or his sisters, one of the two. Well, he didn't have the talent to get his own uh, NIL money, so, I mean, he's got to get it from somewhere, right? There you go. All right, guys, Ohio State, back to some football. That was fun. Back to some football here. Um Matt, and help me with the last name here, Guerreri, maybe? We are all uncultured swine, Eric. I can't believe you asked for our that assistance. That works for me. Yeah, okay, Matty G. How about Matty G? Matty we'll roll G. with that. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, he was hired as a senior advisor and analyst for the coaching staff. Um, comes from Duke, where he spent a lot of time there. Jim Knowles and he both coached uh, the Blue Devils back when Duke was actually a decent football team. And uh, he's decided to come on as the senior advisor and analyst. He's not a part of the 11-man 11, 11 coaching staff at Ohio State, but he's basically taking the role as analyst. Aaron, you've talked about this before. I'm going to give you the floor. What do you think about this guy, this position? Explain to everybody what's going on here. I'll be honest, guys. I don't know much about him Um in this role or in any other role for that matter, but he must have some substance to him for Ryan Day to hire him on staff, period. That's that that's my personal thoughts on it. Uh, as far as what he's going to be doing, like what is an analyst, you guys might ask. And, and as Eric said, you know, we've kind of talked about this in the past, but it's been a while. So I'll go back over it again. Uh, an analyst is basically that's that's what I like to do. They're going to look at film and they're going to basically advise the coaching staff uh, on on the nuances of the opponent for that week. They could even look up to two to three weeks ahead, taking notes and preparing film for the players to watch because they don't uh, believe it or not. We're in the age of technology, guys. So everybody's got access to huddle or other uh, apps or whatever things like that. So. An analyst will prepare film for the players slash coaches to watch and better prepare themselves for what the opponent is going to do um, in an advisory role, though, because uh, I think it listed that as well. Um, he's I mean, he's basically just going to help out with like the rules of the game techniques with coaching. Um, and believe it or not, even as an analyst, even though he's not a part of the 11 man uh, coaching staff, exactly, he can't coach in the games but he can be there, uh, and in the practices, he can actually 
talk to the coaches and give like context to what's going on so that they can better prepare the players. Perfect. Chris, you want to add anything to that? Well, I'll tell you, I love it. I actually love this hire. He's a former def- co-defensive coordinator down at Duke. He took that spot after uh, Jim Knowles left to go to Oklahoma State. Uh, smart guy, was a grad assistant at Duke. Um, you know, he, he's got some experience. He's He has coached three All-American safeties in the past. Uh, so, again, we're really addressing that defensive backfield, which, you know, has been a major question over the last few years. I mean, I, I love the emphasis we're putting there. This is a guy who played safety. He's coached safeties. Uh, I think he's going to give a lot to that analyst position. Um, so, yeah, I love the hire. Also, he's an Ohio native. Mm, he's, from Will- he's from Willoughby Hills, Ohio, so he knows a little something about Ohio State football. Let me cool. Hey, let me throw this in there, too, man. Not only do we have this guy, which that's good stuff, Chris. I didn't know that about him. I, I mean, I knew he came from Duke and that he had ties with Jim Knowles, but I wasn't sure what, you know, all those – everything you just shared – but not only do we have him on the staff, we also have Paul Rhodes as a defensive analyst. Yes. So you got these two geniuses working together. That's I mean, the, the <laughs> we got top notch analysts up there breaking down the film for these guys to watch. You think they're not going to be prepared this season? I'm pretty sure they'll be all right. Beautiful, guys. Thank you for your intake uh, input on that. And uh, I'll be interested to see. These analyst guys, they kind of, they kind of hang around in the shadows. You know, you don't get to interview them, you don't hear from them, but it sounds like they could have a huge impact on your team. So, uh, looking forward to to learning a little bit more about that, hopefully. So, yesterday I got to do something really, really cool. I wanted to share with you guys, and some of our listeners did as well. Uh, Ryan Wickerham, he posted a picture uh, of the event that I was at yesterday. He too was there, uh, up in Lima, Ohio. Um, I, I, well, let me go back. My good friend, Carl Hugler, who Aaron knows, um, big Buckeye fan. And you'll learn a little bit about him here in a, shortly in a few minutes. But for Christmas, I bought a autograph session tickets, um, in Lima to meet several Buckeyes. And I bought one for myself. And I bought one for, for him. And we spent yesterday, uh, going to this big convention center there in Lima where they had a, Sports card thing and memorabilia you could buy, and which I I spent way too much money doing that, but that's neither here nor there. But then you got to meet some of these Buckeyes, including Tyleek Williams, Taraja Mitchell, Ronnie Hickman, Steel Chambers, and Mayan Williams. I bought a Ohio State helmet for them to all sign, and as they were signing it, I told them that this was going to be our 2022 national championship helmet. All of them gave me a fist bump on that. That was real big, but uh, let me say real fast. Tyleek Williams might be the biggest human being I've ever seen, and that includes – he's right up there with Orlando Pace, guys, and how big of a human being this guy is. Just swallow you whole type of per- human being. No wonder he had the type of year he had. This guy is going to be awesome. Um, Taraja Mitchell and I had a great conversation about his dad who I met, so that was cool. Uh, Ronnie Hickman was there to sign autographs and smile and nod his head. <laughs> <laughs> true defensive player steel chambers and i had a great conversation i told steel chambers that he won our chris spielman award for our linebacker of the year and he was he wanted to know all about that and then i think he was like where's my award at dude <laughs> so you didn't uh, take him the trophy no yeah, yeah really right? yeah what the right. heck you know if yeah. you brought the trophy he may have been on this week eric oh gosh my bad guys my bad drop the ball we're yeah. gonna start and, calling you bryce and shaw now <laughs> oh one star on me huh <laughs> <laughs> bad bad um and then i'm gonna be honest mine williams didn't want to be there yesterday you could tell <laughs> he uh i'm a little worried guys about that either he's just not an outgoing person and that's fine or Mayan Williams, I, he's like, uh, I don't want to be here because I don't want to be here if you catch my drift. Hope I'm wrong. Hope I'm wrong. Um, anyways, it was a great time, a great event. It was awesome meeting those guys, getting their autographs on my on my 2022 National Championship helmet. 
There's going to be a chance here in a couple months to meet more of these get fellows and get more autographs for that helmet, Chris. I think yep. you and I are planning on going to Hilliard in March to meet some more of the Buckeyes. Some of these same guys are going to be there as well. Some of the old timers are going to be there. And some some people who aren't even associated with Ohio State, if I'm not mistaken, will be there to sign autographs. So a lot of fun two day event there. Going to be heading to that. But that got me thinking. My top five Buckeye encounters, times I met someone who was connected to Ohio State or the program in some way, shape, or form, or places within Buckeye world that gave me a great memory. I'll start my list. I'll go my, me, then Chris, then Aaron. That's how we'll do it. We'll go from five to one. Number five for me was meeting Cornelius Green, Rose Bowl MVP Cornelius Green a couple years ago. He was honored at Ohio Stadium for being nominated and selected to be in the Rose Bowl Hall of Fame. Got the chance to meet him and have about a five-minute conversation with him. Such a great, humble man. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe he was the first African-American quarterback for Ohio State and really paved the way for um, the modern-day quarterback uh, and the, his ability to pass and run the football. He was really ahead of his time. And Cornelius Green was just a great guy who really cared about everybody. He, he he really cares about all of Buckeye Nation and making sure you know that he cares for you, which is really, really cool. So meeting Cornelius Green was number five for me. Chris, go for it. Well, I'll tell you what. For me, it was actually meeting uh, – and he's one of your favorites, I know, Eric – meeting Jim Trestle. Just a super nice, pleasant guy. I uh, was at an event uh, down in Columbus and had the opportunity to meet him. Um, you know, he took the time to literally, I think he took and shook everybody's hand in the room and at least took two, three minutes out of his schedule to go through and talk to everybody, introduce himself, address you by name once you told him your name when he would respond back to you. Just a super engaged, really likable guy. All right. So for me, uh, my number five was probably Andy Katzenmoyer, and that's largely wow. because I didn't really get to talk to him outside of saying good game because uh, he coached at Westerville South when I was at Olentangy, uh, and we beat him, and that's when they had Jalen Gill at running back. And uh, so it wasn't really a good outcome for him. He didn't look too happy. So, you know, it was the, the typical – end of game handshake stuff. So, uh, he was a liar. Yeah, that was a, that was a huge human being. Like even, uh, being an older guy, he was very massive, but I mean, I, I, he looked upset, but he said good game. So, I mean, he spoke, it was good, whatever we beat him. Uh, I don't have an encounter other than I saw him one time. We were eating at a Mexican restaurant in, uh, the Polaris area, Aaron, and he walked in with his wife. I think it's his wife, maybe girlfriend. I don't know. But, uh, Huge human being still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Number four for me is a childhood memory. Um, in Mount Vernon back in the day, they used to run this big event where they would have like a two on two basketball tournament. They'd have vendors selling baseball, football, basketball cards. Someone big would come in to do autographs. And Jim Carsados would show up every year for about two to three hours. They'd hang a, um, t a tire up from the ceiling and you could pay $2 to challenge to beat him. You'd get the chance to throw the football three times through the tire and see how many times you could throw it through. And then Jim Carsados would do it. And if you beat him, then you actually not only got your dollar back, I think you would win 2 or $3 of Jim Carsados' money. But literally, he's sitting there taking money from kids all day long. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it was awesome. It, it was so cool to get – basically – and in, and when he wasn't throwing it through the tire, he was throwing it with the kids. He would throw it back and forth with all the kids. Um, so I got to play catch with Jim Carsados. Pretty cool memory for me, man. Um, to this day, I still remember that. And I also remember Paul O'Neill rolling up in a limousine to sign autographs that day. <laughs> Little side nugget. Chris, go for it. Well, I'll tell you what, I had one of these moments just this year, Eric, and I, I got to thank you for it partially, but that was getting to be and hang out with Mike Wargo a little bit over there in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, just a super nice guy. You know, I'll be honest, I had never really heard his story before you uh, brought it to the podcast, and then the opportunity to go over there and hang out with him, just I thought a super nice guy. 
All right. So for number four, for me, Anthony Schlegel, uh, and this is also when I was at Olin Tangi, um, super nice guy. Honestly, he looks like he could still play. I'm not, no joke. He looks like he could still put a hit on somebody. Uh, the reason I got to meet him though, is because he invented a piece of equipment to help players, uh, with their hands, hand, hand work basically. So, uh, they installed them in the weight room, uh, on the squat racks. So you would do your workouts, your warm ups, whatever. And then you'd go over there and hit that thing. They'd get the players would get in lines and they would have to hit it uh, three to five times with perfect form. Like it was basically for blocking or hands, whatever you wanted to use it for is pretty cool piece of equipment. Uh, but he owned the company that installed those and he came personally to repair one uh, that was defective or replace it. I can't recall at this point. It's been like five, six years ago. So uh, that was a pretty cool encounter, in my opinion. Uh, Anthony Schlegel. Number three. By the way, I hope he comes back to the fan if uh, they don't. Jacksonville doesn't keep him. Uh, number three, running into Coach Earl Bruce along with my friend Carl, who I was talk, uh, talking about earlier. Uh, Carl um, was a student trainer with Ohio State back in the early 80s. Uh, and back when Earl Bruce took over the team from Woody Hayes. And so the 82 team, uh, Carl was the basically the head student trainer on that team. And a couple years ago, the year before Earl passed, we ran into Earl outside of the stadium. And Carl uh, ran up to him, and Earl remembered him, and they got to talk to each other. And that meant the world to Carl, and I could tell that it, it was nice for Earl as well to remember someone who he hadn't seen since 1982, but yet remembered him. And it was just an awesome experience for me to witness, even though I, I basically got to shake his hand. That was it. But for my friend Carl, my best friend Carl, to have that experience with the coach he worked for was so rewarding for for me and for him, obviously. So that's number three for me. Number three for me, and I'm going to preface this with no laughing, guys. Just saying. But Archie Griffin, I'm telling you, this guy just super nice guy. I first got the opportunity to meet him when I was on the regional campus homecoming court. Again, no laughing. <laughs> in 2013. Uh, you know, got to speak hey, with him hey, before. Hold on. Don't. You're not going to slide by with this one. What, were you this cleaning up like, afterward? What? <laughs> Wait a minute. Those pictures, man. I got to see them. You I'm, need to post them. That's how this, that goes. This show has Aaron basically telling us that he's got a man crush from Tate Martell. Hey, hold up now. And, and you were on homecoming court in college. Yes. One star show. As, <laughs> and, and Eric. <laughs> I was 40 years old when I was on the homecoming court in college. What? <laughs> yes. He had only one person voted. Who was your competition? <laughs> Did they know about um, this? It, was, it wasn't fair, man. It wasn't fair. I was, I was beaten down. They got this really good looking guy from, I can't remember where he was from. He was from South America. And that was the guy I was up against. It wasn't right. <laughs> They felt, everybody felt sorry. <laughs> this is great. Hey, but I but I came in second in the in the voting. There was actually I think four of us in there. <laughs> Go for it. <clears throat> so anyhow, <laughs> I yeah, I had I had the opportunity to uh, to meet Archie uh, before the uh, before the game. They, they did a big event for the regional homecoming people over at the uh, the uh, Loggenberger Alumni House. Um, you know, I've met him subsequently twice since, or three times since then. Uh, once at an event out here at OSU Marion, uh, which was tied in with the homecoming court the following year, which my wife was on. <laughs> and, uh, oh, sure, you don't laugh at Bobby being on the homecoming court Did she as a non traditional student. But what's that? Did she win? I know, she was a runner up. Just oh, like so you. you get to hold that. Okay. All right. But my brother actually did win that year. Wait a minute. What? But my brother was the home, regional campus homecoming king that this year. This story is okay. really weird, man. All right. Homecoming at OSU Marion is fixed. That's all there is to it. <laughs> That's got to be what's going on here. I'm telling you, I've got all the pictures. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, Archie, uh, just a super nice guy. 
also met him one day just walking across campus, and he will literally take the time to stop, shake your hand, talk to you, uh, you know, take a picture with you, sign an autograph. Always got time for any fan. Just absolutely love the guy. He's great. All right. <clears throat> so I can't match that one. <laughs> but... <laughs> But my number three, uh, when I was a young kid, I, I think I had to have been seven or eight years old. Um, I got to meet Bobby Hoying. He was doing an autograph signing, and I cannot remember where, but my mom took me, and I got a picture of him that's since been ripped up by whatever. I don't know how that happened, but it did. But uh, Bobby Hoying, super nice. I, I don't remember a whole lot, but I remember him being super cool, uh, very friendly. I remember giving a high five. So obviously, as a seven or eight year old, the Ohio State quarterback that you see on television every week giving you a high five meant the world. So uh, I'm going to go with Bobby Hoying at number three for me. Number two in the vein that Aaron has there, another kid story for me. Uh, as I've said on the show before, Ryan Miller is my cousin. He played in the mid 90s, middle linebacker, was on the 96 team that went to the 97 Rose Bowl and won against uh, Jake the Snake Plumber, which was the night where my fandom was sealed for the rest of my life. But um, <clears throat> Ryan's parents would always get multiple tickets, and once or twice a year, they would have my brother, myself, my mom, and dad. Uh, get to sit with them on the 50 yard line with all the family. And so I, I remember meeting like Orlando Pace's mom and, and I've told that story and things of that nature. But after the game, we would hang around the locker room and the players would come out and I got to meet Eddie George and Orlando Pace and um, all these great Buckeyes that were a part of that team. Mike Vrabel, Luke Fickle, um, all of these guys. Uh, back when they were players. But anyways, um, one time we got to go out to eat with them on campus with Ryan and his parents and uh, some of the players and their parents. And they basically the whole section was all Buckeyes and their parents. And we got to sit and be a part of that. And I have never forgotten how cool it was to be sitting at the table with all of these Buckeye players who were playing. I think Finkus might have been there as well. Um, just awesome experience in my childhood never forget it that's number two for me my number two for me was uh, actually meeting maurice claret uh he came to an event that uh, we were hosting down at the marion campus here one of our spring fest events he came down to uh sign some autographs talk to some fans uh, he actually brought his wife and his daughter along just wonderful people his daughter and my daughter played for a few hours out there uh, he ended up sticking around even longer than he was obligated to stick around, uh, just hanging out, talking to, you know, the the event staff, the university staff, just uh, real, real pleasant guy. Even before he left, gave me an autographed copy of his first book. So, yeah, just a great guy. All right. So number two for me <clears throat> was actually from when I played semi-pro. Uh, and this name may be long forgotten. I don't know, but it's not by me. Uh, Paris Long. I don't know if you guys remember him at all. He played in the late 90s, mm -hmm. uh, 97 to 99, I think, or 2000. Uh, he was on the D-line, uh, and he also played D-line for the team that I played for, the Mid-Ohio Jets, uh, for the 2009 and 10 season. Uh, super cool dude. Super cool dude. Also a massive human being uh, and a very good football player. Uh because, I mean, he was – at that time, he'd have been out of college for 10, 11 years at that point, and he was still getting down. Like, he was a bad dude, but he was cool, just down to earth. So definitely Paris Long. Number one for me is very similar to Chris's other than the fact that I was not a part of a homecoming court. I got to meet the two-time Heisman Trophy winning Archie Griffin, got my picture with him. Um when I put my arm around him and he put his arm around me for the picture, I swear the 60-some-year-old Griffin at the time, which I think he might be getting closer to 70 now, uh, could still play football. Dude is, dude is still ripped for his age. But the one of the nicest human beings, and I've said it for a long time, Ohio State couldn't ask for a better ambassador for the athletic department than Archie Griffin. Um, awesome guy. Love the man, even though he played well before I was born. His legacy has just meant everything to this program that I love so dear. So Archie Griffin, number one, meeting that guy was awesome. Well, I'll tell you, number one for me, so 
a few years ago, I was an assistant manager for Aaron's Rentals, and uh, Beanie Wells was our spoke per- spokesperson. Uh, you know, Beanie came into the store down in Marysville. He actually uh, came in a little early, did some autographs for all the employees, just kind of hung out, talked to us a little bit. Um, just a real nice, down-to-earth guy. Big guy. You know, you think running back, you don't think that big. He's a pretty big dude. Uh, but yeah, I mean, just, and it didn't matter. We we could have lined up, lined up 50 things there. He would have signed every single one of them. Just totally a really, really nice guy. Hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, uh, so you guys, well, Chris, you talked about Maurice Claret, and he's actually my number one. Um, I can't remember the year, but uh, it was sometime after his book came out. I just remember that time frame. Um, but uh, my wife, Heather, and I were at Polaris Mall just kind of walking around, you know, just looking at stuff, whatever. And I'm looking around, and I see this buff dude, like just, you know, just out of nowhere. He pops out of nowhere, and I was like, is that Maurice Claret? Because, I, you know, he kind of like – I remember him looking left, and I saw his face, and I was like – yeah, that, I think that's Maurice Claret. I told Heather, and I was like, I'm going to go try to talk to him. <laughs> and so uh, we kind of like walked closer. We weren't trying to be weird or anything, but it, you know, in retrospect, telling the story, it sounds weird. I understand. But uh, I think that he heard me say, I think that's Maurice Claret, because he turned around and I said, yep, that's him. And he just stopped and we just started talking. It was the weirdest thing, but super down to earth guy. You know what I mean? I I told him I I got a chance to tell him that him playing that one year at Ohio State, what that meant to me, because when he played at Ohio State, I was in eighth grade. So I was just kind of coming into my own and I played running back and watching him. He wasn't, a, you know, the biggest guy on the field, but he got the job done, as we all know. And just that meant a lot to me going into high school. And I got to tell him that. And it was cool to shake his hand and, and just, you know, share stories and just kind of talk for, I think we stood there for probably 35, 45 minutes. Heather was ready to roll, but I was like, look, this guy here is like considered a childhood hero. Like I understand the trouble he's been in and, and, and all that good stuff, but I didn't think of anything like that because at this point he was past all the prison and the, and the DUIs and things like that. And he just, it, he just, he wasn't what I thought that he would be, you know, um, when you, when you read the stories and hear everything on the news, like he was just super cool, super cool. Like I, I we talked like we'd been best friends for 30 years. Like it was just a different experience for me. Never thought that anything like that would happen, but it did. So, uh, Maurice Claret, definitely number one for me. All right, there you have it. There's our top five, Buckeye Encounters. Uh, Very cool list, guys. That was a lot of fun. Hope you all enjoyed that. And, of course, we would love to know some of your great Buckeye Encounters. You can do so by letting us know uh, on Facebook, or you can email us at theohiopodcast at gmail.com. Again, theohiopodcast at gmail.com. Next up is an interview with one of our fans who came to one of the live shows that we did, Chris. And, of course, you mentioned uh, Wargo there in Pittsburgh, a part of the Pittsburgh Alumni Association. Uh, uh, The very – the the Rudy of Ohio State football is uh, how Mr. Wargo uh, kind of uh, uh, labels himself. Great story. We've had him on the show. And we're going to go back to Pittsburgh next year, Chris, for another live show. They invited us back. Really looking forward to that. It's going to be a lot of fun. But Eric Osbeck came out to our POW show, and uh, I wanted to have him on the podcast to talk about that and talk about his fandom. He is so passionate about Ohio State. It comes across so plain uh, when he speaks about his love for Ohio State and where it came from, from his mom, who was a cheerleader, to uh, he and his wife um, at the uh, taking their first date to the horseshoe. I mean, this guy bleeds scarlet and grace. So you're going to love that. Also, I want to also invite you to go to our YouTube page or go to our Facebook page where we posted a YouTube video. So a couple shows ago, I think it was episode number 200, we had our 2021 Buckeye Awards. Uh, Well, that is now a YouTube video that I think a lot of you are going to enjoy. took a lot of time to put together, but I couldn't help myself. So that was 
like I said, I'm going to start dipping my water into YouTube. So we'll see how that goes. But would invite you all to go and check that out. Let us know what you think of that. All right, guys, that's that's it for you two. Eric Osbeck's going to come back with me for that interview here in just a minute. You're all going to love that. We will be back next week uh, to talk more Buckeyes, and uh, hopefully this coaching staff will be solidified. We get to hear from these coaches, and we get to talk a little bit more about that. I know recruiting is coming down to the home stretch. Uh, the final uh, re, uh, signing day period is quickly approaching, so we will have that to talk about in the coming weeks as well. So there's still a lot of good stuff to discuss, and we're going to do all of that in the coming weeks. So make sure you hang tight after this commercial. Come back and listen to Eric with a K and Eric with a C talk about the Buckeyes with both C and K. So hang tight. The OHIO Podcast is brought to you by Mastermind. Mastermind specializes in 360-degree high-definition mobile video mapping, GIS integration, and traffic safety studies. Mastermind cares about traffic safety and keeping you safe on the roadway. Visit Mastermind at OnlineMastermind.com. And welcome back to the OHIO podcast, everybody. And as promised, I am joined by one of our listeners, Eric Osbeck, how you doing this afternoon, Eric? I'm doing fantastic. How about yourself? Doing well, my friend. And so we've been doing this little thing where we're interviewing uh, Buckeyes, former Buckeyes. Uh, I've got some great interviews lined up, but uh, wanted to start off with some of the our listeners who are tried and true guys who and gals who've been with us since the beginning. Eric, I don't know exactly when you f- uh, found us, but uh, Boy, it seems like uh, when you did, you jumped right in there with two feet and uh, started contributing on the on the uh, Facebook page with great questions and comments and uh, even came to one of our live shows, man. So that was awesome to meet you in person. So tell me a little bit about yourself, about your fandom with uh, Ohio State and how you managed to find us. Uh, well, first of all, I'm very honored to be on the program and uh, especially with the lineup you got going. So thank you for that. Um, my fandom goes way back. Um, my mother actually was a, uh, cheerleader for Ohio State back in the fifties. Um, and she kind of just put her love for Ohio State into me and my brother. And, uh, I've just been a fan my whole life. Uh, my wife and I, when we were dating, our second date was going to Ohio State, Michigan. And so it's just, it's ingrained in me. Everything in my basement is scarlet and gray everything i have is scarlet and gray i bleed scarlet and gray uh when they play carmen ohio i always shed a tear it's just it's just <laughs> in me it's just i get a chill every single time i hear those you know the the bells going off and it's just it's it's just the greatest being a fan is just i mean i, I can't think of any other school i would want to be associated with me neither, me neither. So how did you come in contact with our podcast, my man? Well, there are a lot of podcasts out there, and uh, everybody puts a lot of hard work into it. I know you do. And I was just going from podcast to podcast. I just really wanted to find something, and yours just kind of really spoke to me. It was the content. It was the interaction between uh, everybody on the show. It was um, stuff on Facebook. I mean, you guys put out not just – audio you know podcast but you put a lot out in the, the facebook page there's a lot of stuff out there there's a lot of information that you uh just have at your fingertips and it's just it's great it's it's a you know a resource for me to kind of you know get some of my information from and you know every time i turn on facebook you're just right there with stuff so it's it's great that's uh, that's why i kind of stuck with you guys because you know your stuff um, it's a fun podcast to listen to, and uh, you know you guys always have something interesting to say. Well, thank you for those kind words. We appreciate it. We, um, you know, I, I kind of guess when we started, Aaron and I, we wanted to to allow our fandom and everything that we do as as fans, much like yourself, we would we just wanted to share that with everybody because we knew that there was more of us out there who want who were trying to swim through the media BS, if that makes sense. 
Oh, absolutely. Tr- trying to get through because th- things become so political sometimes. And it's just kind of like, man, I just want the facts. Just give me give me the facts as a fan. And so and, we and try. That's, that's why I love your show, because that's what you guys do. You guys, you know, sometimes you bring it up at the beginning of the show. But then you say, hey, you know what? We're going to talk about what we want to talk about. And, you know, if it goes against conventional wisdom, you guys don't care. You guys talk about that. Um you know, even the introduction to your show just it gives me chills. Just listen to, <laughs> you know, the the speeches and everything like that. And you know, I'm not going to talk about another podcast from a team <laughs> that might be up north. Yeah. But you know, I kind of started listening to him a little bit too at the beginning before I found you guys. And it's interesting that that podcast starts out with you know audio and all that stuff, but Everything before 1999, you know, yeah. they don't have they don't have any new things that they had to put on the beginning of their podcast to get their listeners fired up. It's all, you know, before phones, basically. So, yeah. you know, but you guys, you know, you, you have those those great sound bites at the beginning and it just kind of gets you pumped up. And I, that's another reason why I kind of stuck with me. I heard the. You know, that Urban Meyer speech and, you know, wood and all that good stuff. And it's like, OK, all right, I like this. It's, it's, this is good. Yeah. So so the, the podcast you're speaking of is is ran by Steve Dace, who's yeah, very. It's a, it's a really good podcast. I mean, he's, yeah. he's been, you know, tortured for a long time. And, you know, um, it's it's good to get a perspective on, you know, the Big Ten from another uh, viewpoint. Um, but you know, it, it always kind of struck me that you know he couldn't find anything that's, you know, even just one play or one great saying from, you know, before, you know, basically my son was born, you know, and it's uh, it's just kind of interesting that way. But you know, that's another thing about being an Ohio State fan. You know, even when we had bad years, I mean, bad years is a relative term for being a Buckeye fan. Like in, during the Cooper years, you could always pull out, you know, you know, the run, you know, where the uh, Keith by whatever it is, you know, it's just you could always pull out something good. You could always have some some great, you know, audio or video um, of Buckeyes. And it just seems like, you know, other other teams, you know, there's not a lot of little stuff like that. So it's, it's great that we have such a um, great tradition. And, you know, every year there's something great that happens. And, um, you know, even this year, I mean, just think of all the teams in in college football and we considered an 11 and 2 season or 12 and 2 season you know to be a step back in a way Mm -hmm. and you know how many teams have killed to only lose two (laughs) games and then win the granddaddy of them all like we did right i mean that's ohio state football Exactly. Exactly. You know, speaking of Cooper, uh, some of the highlights, you know, I remember Eddie George against Illinois was huge. The yes. the 96 season when they played in the Rose Bowl on January 1st of 97, my cousin Ryan Miller was on that team. Right, right, um, exactly. That was just a that was an amazing night for me. Uh, I think I was a freshman in high school and my my fandom just exploded that day. From that moment on, I I I, I vowed to hardly ever miss a game if at all possible because I just just fell in love with Ohio State much like yourself, Eric. Um, now you did come out to our live show in PAL, so tell me yes, what I you did. thought about that. Uh, it was fun. It was a great. First of all, the venue was awesome. It was perfect, um, and you guys had a great setup. And you know, you gave out some prizes that were just phenomenal. I mean, they were awesome. I'm wearing the shirt right now that I got there. Um, but, you know, everybody was involved and, and you got everybody involved and people were having a good time. And, you know, I just I loved it. I was hoping you guys could get another one by the end of the year. But, you know, maybe next year, you know, we could there could be another couple or whatever. But it was it was a great time. Uh, everybody seemed to have, really enjoy themselves. And uh, like I said, the place you guys had it was perfect. Um, so, yeah, I, it was great. I've never been to a, a live podcast like that before. So that was fun. Yeah, we're we're gonna do those some more of those. That was at the Gallows Tap Room in Pal. Uh, right. that Eric's talking about, and, I, and that was my first time there. And uh, we went back. My wife and I went back, Eric, and and man, is their food really good? And it's reasonably priced too. So uh, definitely recommend that to anybody. And of course, that was in conjunction with the Delaware 
uh, county uh, alumni association. And uh, we, we try to do these with the alumni associations to kind of be their entertainment or their DJ before a game, kind of like a, uh, a tailgate. And uh, of course, Eric, we want to invite you and your wife out to our tailgate that we'll be doing. We'll have a lot of more information about that for the spring game. Want to try to get as many of our listeners and friends together as we possibly can. We're going to have a that. We're going to have a big tailgate breakfast. I'm going to take the grill out there. We're going to have a huge breakfast and just a great time before the game. And then we're all just going to go to the shoe together and sit in one section, one big OHIO podcast section. I think it'd be a lot of fun, my man. That sounds amazing. All right. So you are officially invited. (laughs) I'm, I'm already pumped. I can't wait. Fantastic. All right. Let's talk a little bit about this past season. You already did a little bit, Eric, by saying, you know, we're kind of spoiled by fans with how, you know, 11 and 2 season kind of feeling like that was a step back. But overall, given everything that this team kind of had had to face this year, how do you feel the season went? Um, You know what? I could handle the loss to Oregon. It was the loss at the end of the year that it'll eat at me until next year. I, and I think it'll lead at everybody who's an Ohio State fan until next year. Uh, I just don't think we came out with any fire. I don't think we came out with uh, the desire to win that they did um, like we have in the past. Uh, I don't know whether it was complacency or I don't know what it was. It just, you know, watching it, it just seemed to me that, you know, we just weren't in it. And we weren't in it the first half of the Rose Bowl either. And then, Somebody gave up and gave a Herb Brooks kind of speech at halftime. I don't know who it was. And, you know, lit some fire under some people, and you could really see it. And hopefully we can bring that into next season. But, I, you know, overall, you know, I had to hear from other fans, you know, that you know, friends I'm, you know, that are my friends that have other allegiances to other schools. You know, Ohio State's defense, this Ohio's defense, you know, you know is, isn't good. They stink. They whatever. But, you know, time and again this year, you know, we had tough competition. And the Big Ten, I think, is one of the toughest conferences out there. And we proved time and time again that we could hang with everybody. And then when we hung it up on Michigan State, I mean, I was like, okay, let's go into the next game. Let's just really decide, you know, with full force. But uh, I, I was happy. I mean, I, I there were some times like everybody else were like, what are they doing? You know, why is it, you know, why can't they, you know, get the offense going? But um, hopefully those are things that Ryan Day can really work on in this offseason. I think he's kind of proven to everybody that he's not afraid to change. Uh, look what he's been doing. He's uh, almost a uh, full coaching change on defense almost, you know, where he wasn't happy either, I don't think. You know, and right. uh, I think that's kind of different than a lot of other schools where it's like, okay, let's try to tweak it here or there or work with what we have. He's like. No, we're going to take it and we're just going to take it down to the bones and build it back up, you know, the Buckeye way. And I think uh, the people he's brought in, I mean, Jim Knowles and um, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Matt Gaiari. Um, they kind of work together at Duke together uh, on the defense. So, you know, those guys are going to click. Um, you know, we got Larry Johnson um, and, uh, you know, and Kerry Combs was great. I, for the years he was here, I think everybody should give him a big, huge round of applause and say thank you for what he's done. I, I, I know a lot of people last year were really on him and uh, really gave him the business, and I think it was kind of unfair. Um, yeah, you know, our secondary was suspect, and you could blame him, but what he gave to Buckeye Nation, I think really, you know, as the years go on, people are going to look back and really understand how much that he really meant to this program. So let's talk a little bit about those coaching changes. Um, Sounds like to me that you're for these coaching changes. Um, I am. I think, you know, uh, teams can't remain stagnant. They can't just say, okay, let's just, you know, keep running this every single year. If you see some problems that you need to address it. And apparently Ryan Day you know, at the end of the season, he really looked at everything that he had and said, OK, these are the changes we need to make. It can't just be uh, a change in attitude. It has to be a complete change of style of coaches. Um, and I don't think he did this lightly. I think that he's been thinking about this. It's maybe the Oregon game where he really kind of saw the, you know, where our armor was the weakest. And I think, 
when he lost to Jim Harbaugh, I think that was the catalyst for a lot of this. Um, last year, you know, when he said, I want to hang a hundred on him is because he kind of thought that Michigan kind of backed out of that game and used COVID as an excuse. And I think that really upset him because he really wanted to play it. Uh, Cause I think he really understands the nature of the tradition of the game. And I think he doesn't think that Jim Harbaugh believes the same way. And I think that really got him. And when we lost this year, I think he was like, okay, this cannot happen again. And all these coaching changes, I think, are a direct result of the game, personally. I think it started with Oregon, but I think it really kind of gelled in his mind that things need to change when, you know, we lost to Michigan. It sure seems like it was solidified at that time. And, um, you know, because he hires Jim Knowles before the Ro- the Rose Bowl. So he exactly he was already making some changes in his mind following that game. And I agree with you, Eric, about that. Um, as far as Ryan Day is concerned, has he earned your trust as the head coach? Oh, absolutely. Um, even when um, Urban Meyer was suspended for was it four games? Um and and he took over as like, OK, this guy knows what he's doing. He, he went for the throat in those games. Um, I like the fact that Ryan Day, when he coaches, he doesn't. When he's ahead, he doesn't. Uh, I'm trying to think of a phrase. He doesn't coach to, you know, not to lose. He actually coaches to win. Um, everything that he's done, I, I have just I, I love him as a coach. He's. Uh, I've heard him speak. I've heard him um, talk about his players. I've heard him talk about the university, about the tradition. Um, I think we've been really lucky. Um, You know, we've had, let's go back, Woody Hayes, and then we had Earl Bruce, and we had Cooper, and he stayed around for a long time, and he was great during the regular season. His, you know, postseason was kind of suspect, and I think that started with the loss to Air Force. But and, and then we had Trestle, and I think Trestle really brought that Ohio State tradition back to where it was uh, under Woody. And then Brian Day is just continuing that. I think he understands the tradition, and he understands, you know, what this team means to the fans and to the state, and um, what what brotherhood was under um, Urban Meyer. I think that kind of came out uh, during some of those uh, Barrett's last year or so where, you know, the term brotherhood was used all the time. Let's do it for the brotherhood. And I think Ryan Day has embraced that. I do as well. Um, I think that Ryan Day is is a genius offensively, but I also think Ryan Day has has that killer instinct that we as fans have been asking for for a while, that Nick Saban-like a win at all costs type of mentality where if you're going to hold me back, I don't care who you are, where you've come from, what your last name is. I'm going to make a change because the W at the end of the day is what I'm paid for. Um, even urban to an extent had some loyalties there that I think cost him in the end, uh, some wins where Ryan day seems to be willing to be loyal. He's loyal, but at the same time, uh, there's a line. There's a line there between loyalty and and winning the football game, and uh, and he's he's leans more towards winning. Those are just kind of my observations of the man. I think he's a phenomenal offensive coach. Like I said, he's a heck of a recruiter, and he's building. He's just he's taking what <coughs> excuse me. He's taking what Urban Meyer has built, and he's built on it and made it even better. In my exactly. in my opinion, I, I agree completely. He was not born on third base he earned that triple <laughs> more than that i think he's gonna hit a home run soon I, that's kind of my feelings as an Iowa state fan what are your expectations for the buckeyes for next season eric uh i think um we have some really tough games up front um notre dame's gonna be tough just because we have some former coaches from ours who are now you know irish so that's gonna be a tough game i think the oregon game uh is gonna really set the stage for the rest of the season. Um, and then, you know, I think that we can take the rest of the Big Ten. I really do. The teams that always worry me are like Wisconsin. Wisconsin worries me every year, and I'm, I don't know if we play them next year, but Wisconsin always worries me. Uh, and then we got, you know, we got the team up north down here, and I think that's going to be 
the show. I think that's going to be a really great game, and I think we're really just going to punch them in the mouth. So uh, I have great expectations. I have great expectations every year. Um, I expect to be in Indianapolis every year, but that's just being a Buckeye fan. Um, but, yeah, I, I think this next year is going to be great. I think these changes um, – who knows if everything is going to gel this year, but, you know, you give these guys a couple of years to get their, their stuff into this program, get their players, you know, on board. And I think you're going to have a train that's not going to be able to be stopped. I like it. I like it. Yeah. I've got certain. So when you look at that schedule, I know my buddy Carl and I've got the Notre Dame Michigan game circle. We're going together with, he's a season ticket holder. Um, I'm planning on going to East Lansing. Uh, I'm going to go see what uh, the Spartan stadiums like. On the road, I, I like to go to one road game uh, every year if I could. Um, didn't get to this past past couple years because of COVID, and then this past year, just too many other things going on. But got that one circled for a road trip. Haven't been to East Lansing before. Looking forward to that. And then, of course, my wife and I will always try to take one of the smaller games to go to and just have fun. Uh, I don't know if that'll be Arkansas State or Toledo. But anyways, those kind of what I've got. And, of course, if we get to Indiana, which I expect that as well, Eric, I'm going to be there. I love to watch Ohio State in that stadium. I don't know if you've – have you been to the Indianapolis I, Lucas Oil? Well, I have taken my son to every Big Ten championship game since uh, Ohio State-Michigan State. Okay. So it's it's a yearly, you know, trip for us. And uh, when we lost against Michigan State, he was upset. I mean, he was upset. I've never seen him that upset after a game. Um, and then, uh, you know, we came back and – you know, we just kept winning and winning, and we own Indianapolis. And um, tell you what, my son is more of a aficionado as far as Big Ten than I am. Because when we played Wisconsin, uh, when we were in 2014, I said, I hope we play somebody else other than Wisconsin. I don't want to play Wisconsin. And he said, no, no, we have to play the best, and we have to be the best. He says, we have to punch these guys in the mouth. We have to just kick them in when they're down and just, you know, not let them score. I said, that's not going to happen. And then what? We won 56 to zero. <laughs> so, I mean, he knows. I mean, so, you know, we've gone every single year uh, except for the COVID year, unfortunately. But, uh, yeah, we that that's where we go every year. That's that's our our big uh, father son road trip is Indianapolis. That's awesome, man. All right. In closing, something I'm going to start. And I, I wish I would have remembered to have done this last week with our our guests from last week. But we'll start it this week. All right. What does it mean to you to be a Buckeye, Eric Osbeck? It's, I don't know. There's, you ask that question, I get that chill down my spine and my, the hairs on the back of my neck go up. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the stuff here in my basement and just all the tradition and all the, the great players that have gone on before. And then you look to the NFL and you look at like the Saints backfield and everybody's a Buckeye. You know, uh, look at the Boses. You look at everybody, and you look at the coaches around the country. I mean, Saban and Schembechler, all these great coaches came from here, came from Ohio State. Ohio State is where it, it, the center of everything. Um, like I said, you know, I hear Carmen, Ohio, and I just I get emotional. It's something just in my DNA that's about being a Buckeye fan. <laughs> I, I just can't. I don't know. It, it, it's something that I, I can't explain. I, I told my wife, I said, you know, at my funeral, the last thing I want played is Carmen, Ohio. <laughs> I want people I want people with their hands over their their friend's shoulders and swaying back and forth. And I just want, you know, the last thing to be O-H-I-O. That's how I want to go out. That's I mean, that that's how I feel. Well, that's how this show goes out every episode, my man. So yep. uh, I, I guess we're uh, we're uh, speaking your language there. So, all right, Eric, appreciate you coming on the podcast with us, man. This was time. a lot of fun. I really appreciate that. And uh, you know how the show ends. So I'm just going to expect you to jump in when it's your turn to do so. As always, be kind to one another. I owe someone's OH and sing Carmen, Ohio with all of your heart. And until next time, OH! I O Go Bucks. Oh, come, let's sing oh, Ohio's praise and songs through Amma Mater rain. 
While our hearts rebounding thrill And joy which death alone can still Summer's heat or winter's cold The seasons pass, the years will roll Time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship, O oh, Hyo.